Good evening. This is an Arise News special report. I'm Debbie Turner-Bell. In just a few moments, U.S. President Barack Obama will deliver a major speech on his plan to use executive authority to address the growing immigration crisis in this country. It is widely believed that, among other things, his executive action would protect as many as 5 million immigrants who are in this country illegally, protecting them from deportation. I am joined here in our New York studios by Anastasia Tonello. She is the American immigration lawyers with the American Immigration Lawyers Association. We also have Andre Richardson, who is a political strategist who has been a consultant to several members of Congress. And joining us on the phone is Chris Chmielinski, who is the director of content and Actis activism with Numbers USA. And he's joining us from Arlington, Virginia. If everybody is here, say present. <laughs> Welcome to all of you. I'm so glad that you're here. We're going to uh, keep an eye on the White House, wait to hear from the president. In the meantime, let's just chat just a little bit. Forgive me if I cut you off suddenly, and that means the president is about to uh, speak. Anastasia, let me start uh, with you. You've seen uh, at least a portion of an advanced copy of what the president is going to say. Give us your broad uh, stroke uh, impression of the announcement that he's about to make. Um, well, it, the, the the initial impression is that it's 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 as much as we could hope for. It's big in that it can affect as much as you mentioned five million people. Um, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program will be extended uh, to not have an age cap, and the and parents of of U.S. citizens and lawful permanent residents will now be eligible for deferred action as well. So that and that alone, those two provisions are very generous. Um, we're also expecting changes to the, um, the legal immigration, so the people in the queue, as well as something potentially for investors and entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. This is something, Andre, that just Congress has not been able to get done for years. It's not <clears throat> just this presidency. Right. Uh, there have been attempts over a number of years. In fact, uh, every president, I think since FDR, President Obama said, has had to take unilateral executive action on, on immigration, issues of immigration, because it just doesn't seem to be able to get done. What do you think it is that this Congress that's coming in in January would need to do to understand not just the importance, I think everybody understands that, uh, but also understand the, the pertinence uh, of it and how it's going to affect uh, the presidential race in 2016? Right. So, so you're exactly right. I mean, um, I think it, we're, we're talking about dating back a half century now. Um, that presidents have uh, executed their uh, executive action. And every, every president over the last um, several decades have also taken measures to, in regards to immigration. Now, as far as the presidential election is concerned, uh, if the gainsmanship continues on the Republican end to you know, try and uh, block this bill continuously, then they're going to lose a huge and growing voting block in the Latino and immigrant community that they're going to have to rely on in 2016 in order to be victorious. Yeah, it's so important. And this does not necessarily include the uh, immigrants that are here illegally, but it's in short order uh, where brown people will outnumber non-brown people in, in this country. And even those of uh, Latino heritage of Hispanic descent will outnumber African Americans. And so it is a, it is a block of great influence. Uh, of influence. I think I'm hearing from our control room now that the president is about to come out and he's speaking. Let's <clears throat> listen to him. It would appear that we're having a bit of audio technical difficulty. I deeply apologize to you. We're working on that, and as soon as we get that fixed, we'll go back to it. Uh oh, seems like I heard him for just one second. Do we have it? It was a compromise, but it reflected common sense. It would have doubled the number of Border Patrol agents while giving undocumented immigrants a pathway to citizenship if they paid a fine, started paying their taxes, and went to the back of the line. And independent experts said that it would help grow our economy and shrink our deficits. Had the House of Representatives allowed that kind of bill a simple yes or no vote, they would have passed with support from both parties. And today it would be the law. But for a year and a half now, 
Republican leaders in the House have refused to allow that simple vote. Now, I continue to believe that the best way to solve this problem is by working together to pass that kind of common sense law. But until that happens, there are actions I have the legal authority to take as President, the same kinds of actions taken by Democratic and Republican Presidents before me, that will help make our immigration system more fair and more just. Tonight, I'm announcing those actions. First, we'll build on our progress at the border with additional resources for our law enforcement personnel so that they can stem the flow of illegal crossings and speed the return of those who do cross over. Second, I'll make it easier and faster for high-skilled immigrants, graduates, and entrepreneurs to stay and contribute to our economy, as so many business leaders have proposed. Third, we'll take steps to deal responsibly with the millions of undocumented immigrants who already live in our country. I want to say more about this third issue because it generates the most passion and controversy. Even as we are a nation of immigrants, we're also a nation of laws. Undocumented workers broke our immigration laws, and I believe that they must be held accountable, especially those who may be dangerous. That's why, over the past six years, deportations of criminals are up 80 percent. And that's why we're going to keep focusing enforcement resources on actual threats to our security. Felons, not families. Criminals, not children. Gang members, not a mom who's working hard to provide for her kids. We'll prioritize, just like law enforcement does every day. But even as we focus on deporting criminals, the fact is millions of immigrants in every state of every race and nationality still live here illegally. And let's be honest, tracking down, rounding up, and deporting millions of people isn't realistic. Anyone who suggests otherwise isn't being straight with you. It's also not who we are as Americans. After all, most of these immigrants have been here a long time. They work hard, often in tough, low-paying jobs. They support their families. They worship at our churches. Many of their kids are American-born or spent most of their lives here. And their hopes, dreams, and patriotism are just like ours. As my predecessor, President Bush, once put it, they are a part of American life. Now, here's the thing. We expect people who live in this country to play by the rules. We expect that those who cut the line will not be unfairly rewarded. So we're going to offer the following deal. If you've been in America for more than five years, if you have children who are American citizens or legal residents, if you register, pass a criminal background check, and you're willing to pay your fair share of taxes, you'll be able to apply to stay in this country temporarily without fear of deportation. You can come out of the shadows and get right with the law. That's what this deal is. Now, let's be clear about what it isn't. This deal does not apply to anyone who has come to this country recently. It does not apply to anyone who might come to America illegally in the future. It does not grant citizenship or the right to stay here permanently or offer the same benefits that citizens receive. Only Congress can do that. All we're saying is we're not going to deport you. I know some of the critics of this action call it amnesty. Well, it's not. Amnesty is the immigration system we have today. Millions of people who live here without paying their taxes or playing by the rules, while politicians use the issue to scare people and whip up votes at election time. That's the real amnesty, leaving this broken system the way it is. Mass amnesty would be unfair. Mass deportation would be both impossible and contrary to our character. What I'm describing is accountability. You can come out of the shadows and get right with the law. If you're a criminal, you'll be deported. If you plan to enter the U.S. illegally, your chances of getting caught and sent back just went up. The actions I'm taking are not only lawful, they're the kinds of actions taken by every single Republican president and every single Democratic president for the past half century. 
And to those members of Congress who question my authority to make our immigration system work better, or question the wisdom of me acting where Congress has failed, I have one answer. Pass a bill. I want to work with both parties to pass a more permanent legislative solution. And the day I sign that bill into law, the actions I take will no longer be necessary. Meanwhile, don't let a disagreement over a single issue be a deal breaker on every issue. That's not how our democracy works. And Congress certainly shouldn't shut down our government again just because we disagree on this. Americans are tired of gridlock. What our country needs from us right now is a common purpose, a higher purpose. Most Americans support the types of reforms I've talked about tonight, but I understand the disagreements held by many of you at home. Millions of us, myself included, go back generations in this country with ancestors who put in the painstaking work to become citizens. So we don't like the notion that anyone might get a free pass to American citizenship. I know some worry immigration will change the very fabric of who we are, or take our jobs, or stick it to middle-class families at a time when they already feel like they've gotten the raw deal for over a decade. I hear those concerns. But that's not what these steps would do. Our history and the facts show that immigrants are a net plus for our economy and our society. And I believe it's important that all of us have this debate without impugning each other's character. Because for all the back and forth of Washington, we have to remember that this debate is about something bigger. It's about who we are as a country and who we want to be for future generations. Are we a nation that tolerates the hypocrisy of a system where workers who pick our fruit and make our beds never have a chance to get right with the law? Or are we a nation that gives them a chance to make amends, take responsibility, and give their kids a better future? Are we a nation that accepts the cruelty of ripping children from their parents' arms? Or are we a nation that values families and works together to keep them together? Are we a nation that educates the world's best and brightest in our universities only to send them home to create businesses in countries that compete against us? Or are we a nation that encourages them to stay and create jobs here, create businesses here, create industries right here in America? That's what this debate is all about. We need more than politics as usual when it comes to immigration. We need reasoned, thoughtful, compassionate debate that focuses on our hopes, not our fears. I know the politics of this issue are tough, but let me tell you why I have come to feel so strongly about it. Over the past years, I've seen the determination of immigrant fathers who worked two or three jobs without taking a dime from the government and at risk any moment of losing it all just to build a better life for their kids. I've seen the heartbreak and anxiety of children whose mothers might be taken away from them just because they didn't have the right papers. I've seen the courage of students who, except for the circumstances of their birth, are as American as Malia or Sasha, students who bravely come out as undocumented in hopes they could make a difference in the country they love. These people, our neighbors, our classmates, our friends, they did not come here in search of a free ride or an easy life. They came to work and study and serve in our military and, above all, contribute to America's success. Now, tomorrow I'll travel to Las Vegas and meet with some of these students, including a young woman named Astrid Silva. Astrid was brought to America when she was four years old. Her only possessions were a cross, her doll, and the frilly dress she had on. When she started school, she didn't speak any English. She caught up to other kids by reading newspapers and watching PBS. And she became a good student. Her father worked in landscaping. Her mom cleaned other people's homes. They wouldn't let Astrid apply to a technology magnet school, not because 
they didn't love her, but because they were afraid the paperwork would out her as an undocumented immigrant. So she applied behind their back and got in. Still, she mostly lived in the shadows until her grandmother, who visited every year from Mexico, passed away. And she couldn't travel to the funeral without risk of being found out and deported. It was around that time she decided to begin advocating for herself and others like her. And today, Astrid Silva is a college student working on her third degree. Are we a nation that kicks out a striving, hopeful immigrant like Astrid? Or are we a nation that finds a way to welcome her in? Scripture tells us that we shall not oppress a stranger, for we know the heart of a stranger. We were strangers once, too. My fellow Americans, we are and always will be a nation of immigrants. We were strangers once, too. And whether our forebearers were strangers who crossed the Atlantic or the Pacific or the Rio Grande, we are here only because this country welcomed them in and taught them that to be an American is about something more than what we look like or what our last names are or how we worship. What makes us Americans is our shared commitment to an ideal, that all of us are created equal and all of us have the chance to make of our lives what we will. That's the country our parents and grandparents and generations before them built for us. That's the tradition we must uphold. That's the legacy we must leave for those who are yet to come. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless this country we love. You have been listening to remarks by President Barack Obama laying out his plan for immigration reform in accordance to the authority that he has with executive action. And you are watching an Arise News special. I'm Debbie Turner Bell. We heard him lay out three primary executive actions that he plans to take, which include cracking down on illegal immigration at the border, deporting felons, not families, and accountability, meaning back criminal background checks and tax and went into detail about each of these. I am joined here at the Arise News table by uh, Anastasia Tonella, who is, um, excuse me, uh, with the American Immigration Lawyers Association. We also have here in the studio Andre Richardson, political strategist, and on the phone we have Chris Chmielinski, Immigration Pro Enforcement Organization, and about Im enforcing the immigration laws that are currently on the books. Chris, we did not get to hear from you before the president began to make his remarks. I know that you feel like the the focus should be now on enforcing the laws that are already on the books instead of coming up with new regulations. What's your reaction to what the president has laid out? Well, it, it was pretty much exactly what, what we expected him to say, and so much had been leaked in advance. Um, and, and obviously, you know, the president, is, he's going to focus on the compelling stories. I mean, we, we don't deny that there are people who are in this country illegally who do have compelling stories. And, and that's one of the reasons why we do support reforming the immigration system. But, you know, we still support that the federal government needs to uphold its responsibility of enforcing the law. And the president put a lot of focus and attention on the border. Much of that is, is a reaction to what happened over the summer with a border surge with the unaccompanied alien children across the border. Um, but. It, it's pretty much a, a commonly accepted number that about 40 percent of the people in the country illegally came first on a legal tourist visa or on a business visa or on a student visa and simply overstayed their visa, and now they're in the country illegally. Securing the border doesn't help us combat that, and that's why we say you need to have some enforcement. And where we do disagree with the president a little bit, that you, we agree, you're not going to round up and deport 11 million people. But nobody, I mean, there are some that are advocating that, but we're not advocating that. All we're saying is let's enforce the law and see what happens. 
So, so much of the issue is you know, that there are, uh, as we have already said, 11, 12 million immigrants that are here illegally. And so part of this is addressing, well, they're here. Mm -hmm. So now what, you, what do you do with them? Right. And to address Chris's point, I mean, I, the president specifically said, if, if you enter now or have committed a crime, you're here on top and you don't fit in these, these different criteria, the chance of being deported has just gone up. You're not, you know, the people who are prioritized um, are going to be the people that, that we should worry about, not the mer parents of Americans, you know, children who are going to, to high school here, who spent their whole whole lives here. Andre, it would seem that the president was uh, was measured in, in his word choice and how he presented uh, this plan. This is an executive a action, so he doesn't really have to sell it uh, right. to, to anyone. But it was so interesting, you know. He invited Congress to, in fact, uh, create legislation that addresses further immigration reform. He said it very succinctly, pass a bill, right. almost like he was daring them. Right. And, and I think we need, we need to look at this bill uh, at its genesis, which is back in June of 2013, when this bipartisan bill was passed by the Senate and House Speaker John Boehner did not want to move on it. So now all of a sudden, you know, the Republicans are winning the midterms and they're threatening all sorts of things like government shutdown, bl uh, blocking appointments and nominations, some of which are very important in regards to some federal judges. So. It, it, as soon as the president institutes executive action, which he has done tonight, he's going to continue to work with Congress and the Senate to hopefully come up with another bipartisan bill uh, that can be passed. Yeah, but he, and, and he was, and I think, in that effort to encourage Congress to act on this, he was very careful to touch on some of the more hot-button issues. Right, and right. he took great pains to explain that this was not amnesty, right. in other words. Right. So I, I think the president, he, he, he's tired of uh, capitulating to a Republican Congress right now. And he just, he just wants to do the work of the American people, why they put him in there, and what he promised to do in his first term. So that's all he's doing. Mm -hmm. Anastasia, did, do you feel like he changed anyone's minds with these remarks tonight? Well, I think that those, and, and I, I can't speak for, for everyone, but I mean, we were a little skeptical, and, and this has been, been postponed many times. We've been hearing, you know, the president will act, the president will act for, for a very long time, and we were, we were kind of worried that it would be insignificant. Um, I think that this, this is quite significant. I think it's big. I think that he, he touched on many of the points that we would have hoped for. It would seem that he was really trying to ratchet up that pressure, too, on, on, on Congress to act. He, he was very impassioned, as Chris aptly pointed out. He did use the emotional story. Astrid Silva, in fact, was a guest on Rise America just yesterday. Hopefully we can get her back uh, tomorrow to talk about the president mis mentioning her uh, in this speech. And then he even went so far as to quote the Bible. Uh, was that sort of a Hail Mary in your eye? <laughs> could have been. Could have no been. pun I'll, intended. Yeah, I'll leave that to the strategist. But I... <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it to me. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I guess I guess that's the book that kind of kind of guides you along the path that you're supposed to follow. Um, but I, I think the president was careful uh, in the words that he chose. I think he's he's tired of he's tired of compromising. I feel like sometimes his job for him is similar to waking up every morning and going to the dentist and working with an obstructionist uh, Congress and now soon to be Senate. So I, I think what he's done here is he's leveled the playing field. He, he's going to change the lives of about 5.2. A uh, million um, soon-to-be Americans, and I think this is fantastic. You know, Chris, uh, Mitch McConnell uh, has said uh, from the time the midterm elections uh, happened that if the president took this action, that it would effectively poison the well, on, the well rather, on many other issues. And he also made a vow that Congress would act to stop the president's actions uh, when the Republicans take control of the Senate in January. Um, this is an odd question, perhaps, for you, but what exactly could Congress do to stop this action? Well, I, I think what, what we're advocating for is, it, is to use their power of the purse. Now, the way that, the, the way that DACA worked was that um, the people that were, the individuals that were eligible for DACA would apply, and if they were avail available, then they would apply for a work permit. Um, so it, it's somewhat fee-based. But that first determination, whether or not they are eligible for the DACA program, takes USCIS caseworkers, and it is not fee-based. So there needs to be some, some funding appropriated to that, and that's actually the first step. So we're advocating that they can actually defund that part of USCIS so they cannot make that determination on whether or not people are eligible for deferred action. Now, 
you're hearing the word government shutdown being tossed around and all that sort of stuff. And I don't know if anybody who is advocating the position that, that we favor is advocating for a government shutdown. Nobody's saying that. In fact, we're saying if you want to fund the government at the levels that exactly what President Obama wants, go ahead and do it. Do that through an omnibus bill or a, a, a continuing resolution or however you feel necessary to fund the government. But put a bill on his desk that fully funds the government except for this one little tiny piece. And, and then if, if the government's going to shut down, that's on the burden of President Obama to determine, all right, do I want to shut down this program or do I want to shut down the entire government instead? So they can use their power of the purse. Um, you know, some of the, the confirmations has come up. They can threaten to block all of President Obama's confirmations. Um, but even if they do that, that allows the president to move forward with the executive action. So it really doesn't stop him from doing it. We think the only thing that can really stop him from doing it is to use their power over the purse. Andrew, let me ask you this. It was only about a year or so ago uh, in, a, in an interview that the president said that the very action that he announced tonight uh, was not in his authority, authority, he thought, and that he would not do it. It wasn't in his best interest to do it. And now a year later, here he is doing it. What happened? Uh, well, he, he's been working on this for so long, uh, about two years now, and it, well, longer than two years, but in the last two years, he's been working with the current uh, Congress and Senate trying to get this done. And, you know, they, they've been sitting on their hands and, and they've, they've left him no choice. So I think the president has, has smartly uh, removed the word compromise fr from his lexicon more recently. And I think he, he's going to continue to work with them, but now he's just, he's in a position where he wants to get this done. He, he's, a, he's a progressive president. We're going to look back in history and everybody's going to be on board with this. Right now, most of Americans don't approve of it. This is a very important landmark piece of legislation that needs to happen right now. Mm. Anastasia, how concerned are you about the vulnerability of these executive actions? The, pre uh, the Republicans have threatened uh, perhaps to bring the president up on articles of impeachment, if not sue him. The Republican Governors Association, particularly the governor of Texas, Rick Perry, has threatened to sue the president for taking this action. Uh, and of course, the next president can, can reverse all of this. Well, that's, I mean, that's, that's, I think the third point is probably the most um, likely, at least realistic. The, the president does have wide powers over immigration laws in their execution and in their implementation. Executive orders have been um, passed or announced by every president since FDR, Republican and Democrats. So um, this is certainly something within the president's Remit. I would, you know, we were talking earlier about the the fees, and and I probably would just question the the fee based of USCIS because those applications are paid for with the filing fees. Mm. So I, I would question how the power of the press will actually be very effective on dealing with with. Um, let me, uh, I understand what you're asking. Chris, let me come back to you. I want to ask you a, a relatively quick question. We're, we're running out of show very quickly. The president's proposal, as I understand it, has been cleared uh, by lawyers from both the uh, Homeland Security Department as well as the Justice Department. So what would be the legal authority upon which any group, whether it's the Governor's Association, the uh, Governor of Texas, or the Congressional Republicans, for legally challenging the president's action here? Well, it, it, it's been basically understood that, yes, executive, the executive branch can use prosecutorial discretion as one of its tools. And that's, that's what he's doing. All he, basically, what he's saying is, is that these five million individuals, you, you don't have to worry about being deported because I'm going to prioritize deportations and, and put terrorists and gang members and criminals, serious criminals first. Um, the part that that really hasn't been challenged by the courts is whether or not he has the authority to issue 5.1 million work permits, um, and, and that that would probably be the basis for most challenges. Um, not, not just that, but then there's the question. It, it looks like that they've been very upfront about um, these individuals not being eligible for any Obamacare benefits or subsidies. The question is, are they going to be eligible for any other public benefits? And a lot of those public benefits, the state pays for. It's on the state budgets. 
So that's where you're seeing um, Governor Perry and, and Abbott out of Texas talking about possibly suing the president for this. Anastasia, where do you want to see this to go next? Well, I mean, the, I think that we're, we hope that we'll see that these people will get Social Security numbers. They're going to get work permits. They're going to be contributing to the economy. They're going to be paying their taxes. We know that the net of immigration is positive. We know that it does create work. It creates jobs. It, it helps the economy. And the next, what's the next step then for the Democratic response? Because this certainly is going to bring a surge, avalanche, if you will, of a Republican response. Right. I, I, well, I think that um, I think the Democrats need to continue to work to continue to work with Congress. And, and let me just just add this this one last point: uh, the Republican Party has a has a shrinking base, and they're going to continue to shrink it if they continue to try and repeal things like Obamacare, Obamacare, and work hard against immigration reform. And come 2016, you're going to see another Democrat in the White House. Mm. Chris, finally, we're just uh, down to the last couple of minutes. Doesn't it just make good political sense for uh, the Republicans to come up with a bill that they can hold their nose and pass to, to get ready for the 2016 presidential election? Because don't you think this will have a big effect if nothing is done in Congress? I think if they could come up with a sensible piece of, of legislation that uh, could get you know, would be fully scrutinized and and could get bipartisan support, similar to what the Gang of Eight bill got. But one of the reasons why the House didn't bring it to the floor was first the Senate never ever sent it to the never sent it to the House, so they could bring it to the floor. But but second, um, there were so many questions that were raised about the bill during the process um, that the House just didn't want to dive into that. I don't think they wanted to dive into all those details. So I think if they could come up with a sensible piece of legislation, um, looking at what the Gang of Eight did and kind of building off of that and maybe making some improvements on that legislation, then I think there's a possibility that, that something could come up. And, and like I said, we, you know, Republicans do. They want to do something. They want to address it. I think they think within the party that they do need to do something by 2016. Um, but... It, it, they do need to figure out a way to separate themselves from the Democrats a little bit on this issue. And if I remember correctly, it was uh, John Boehner in the House who said that they would not work on the legislation that the Senate passed. He said that they wanted to write their own legislation. So I'm not as sure that it was the Senate wouldn't send it over. I think the House wasn't interested. Uh, sitting so in wanted committee to do as well piecemeal. in Congress. He wanted to do it piecemeal, right? Yeah. Anything, we're almost out of time. Very quickly, Anastasia, anything left out of these executive orders you wish you had seen? Quickly. Um, I guess <laughs> more, more on business. We would have liked to see a little more business visas. Yeah, yeah. Well, this conversation certainly is going to uh, continue. Anastasia, Ton Anastasia Tonella, thank you so much for being here. Andre Richardson and Chris Chmielinski, we thank all of you for spending this evening with you. This has been a Airrise News special report. We have listened to the president give his executive action on immigration. Good night. <laughs>